excited about this candid conversation that we will have today. Hey, welcome to the virtual edition of the West Louisville Forum. I'm Miss Crystal Goodner Spratt, the Director of Communications for Simmons College of Kentucky. Hey, first off, we want to thank our faithful sponsors, Park Community Credit Union, for always investing in Simmons College, and we thank them so much for being a continual sponsor of the West Louisville Forum. Hey, we want to congratulate again our class of 2020 that graduated about two weeks ago. Congratulations to Simmons graduating class of 2020. And we can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Uh, our moderator, Dr. Lewis Brogdon, just completed a successful run of our Radical MLK class. He did an amazing job. So much was learned through uh, that course. And from what I'm understanding, that might be coming back in the spring. So please uh, stay uh, connected to our social media on Twitter and Facebook for more information about that. Hey, yesterday was Giving Tuesday and we wanna thank everyone that supported Louisville's only HBCU. A big shout out goes to the church, goes out to the Churchill Downs uh, Incorporated for their contribution of 20 thousand dollars. You, if you are watching us on our Facebook page, you can see that donate tab. Don't forget, you can click that donate tab to uh, donate to Simmons College. You can also donate by visiting us online at SimmonsCollegeKY.adu. So let's get here to do what we've come to do, and that is have this discussion. Our virtual West Louisville Forum topic today is Trump and the death of the white evangelical church. Church. Joining the conversation will be Reverend Dwight McKissick, pastor and former member of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary Board of Trustees. Reverend Joe Phelps, he is the Empower West co-chair and Southern Baptist Theological Seminary alumni, and also Reverend Jimmy Phelps, who is a recent graduate of uh, SBTS and a PhD candidate and our wonderful moderator, Dr. Lewis Brogdon. He is a research professor and department chair of Baptist Seminary of Kentucky and Simmons College of Kentucky. To all of our viewers, thank you so much for lending us your time. Please compose your questions, pose them in the chat and 10 minutes before we get ready to wrap, we will get to those questions. So without further Without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our wonderful moderator, Dr. Brogdon. Well, good afternoon, friends. It's kind of slash good morning right before we uh, head into the afternoon. We are so uh, excited to have you uh, join for a very, very important conversation, uh, a conversation about uh, the white evangelical church, and we'll spend some time uh, giving uh, focused and particular attention to uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and Southern Seminary as our panelists are all, uh, you know, that, that they're alumni. So, you know, they, they have experience uh, and, and perspective that's really going to, I, I think, uh, challenge us uh, and continue to impact us uh, and empower us in this sort of important ongoing work that we are doing. Uh, so welcome. Uh, just take a few moments and go ahead and share so that we can uh, get the word out uh, and, you know, and, and invite as many people to kind of be a part of this conversation as possible. And don't be shy. Put some of those questions in the chat box. Uh, put those panelists, look, put them on the hot seat, okay? Just, I mean, warm that seat up for a good uh, 20, 30 minutes for them uh, so that we can get all that we can get from them uh, so that we can continue this very, very important work. Uh, so what I want to do is I just want to spend just a, a, a couple of minutes, not very long, and we're going to turn these panelists loose. Uh, framing our discussion, I, I want you to kind of understand why we are where we are and sort of why it's important to have a, this particular conversation. We're in this period where I call this an, an era of a reckoning. And it's a reckoning over America's uh, racist past. And Basically, for the past five years, we have been seeing colleges, universities, denominations, governments across the world um, have been exploring their ties to slavery. 
And when we talk about their ties or their connections, we're really talking about two things. Um, institutions and governments and, and various entities have really seen their complicity, their support of slavery and, and systems uh, of oppression. So, you know, that's what I mean when, I, when they're exploring their ties, they're talking about, they used to support this, this stuff. And then secondly, ties means they benefited financially. The uh, slavery generated wealth, systems of oppression. When it underprivileges someone, it is privileging someone else. So I just want you to kind of understand because we use language a lot of times that people don't really know exactly what we're talking about. And so it's kind of been this time of we've been seeing bold movements like the 1619 Project, the Angela Project, uh, the, the ADOS movement, uh, the, the lynching museum that's, uh, you know, went up down in Alabama. So we're, we're in this hot, we're in this, this, this time of a reckoning. And during this time of a reckoning over our racist past, you know, I've sort of discerned a troubling pattern. And it basically goes like this. Organizations and institutions and entities and, and even some governments have been willing to acknowledge their, com their complicity. They're, they're willing to admit, yeah, we, were, we supported slavery. We per perpetuated racist ideas. Uh, and some will even issue some kind of statement of repentance. We have, I have right here before me, a report on slavery and racism in the history of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's just one example. Uh, Georgetown University, they put out their own statement. So a, a lot of these entities, they're willing to say, we were doing some things that were wrong for hundreds of years. But then there is kind of a willingness to acknowledge we've also benefited financially from enslaving Africans uh, and from also complementing 246 years of slavery with these other uh, systems. And so some are willing to say, hey, we benefited. But that's a growing edge for the movement. And then there's, there are these calls to, to kind of, well, we need to study this more. Uh, and, and kind of see who benefited. Or when they do something, it's mostly kind of in-house. So Georgetown, Princeton, Virginia Theological Seminary, uh, their earmarked money to basically be used by their own institution. So there's been really nothing substantive that has been done to really address these larger mass issues. And so it is into this context that we have uh, this conversation because the, the white evangelical church has been very, very hesitant, very, very slow, uh, particularly our Southern Baptist sisters and brothers to really kind of weigh in uh, and to exercise a leadership and a prophetic role uh, in this movement and in this time. So I would love for our panelists to just begin with the sort of opening statement, uh, you know, anywhere from a couple of minutes to up to about five minutes, just talking about why do we need to have this conversation and or uh, tell us a little bit about your experience and what you bring to this uh, conversation. Uh, and then we'll just hit the ground running from there. And so we, we'll start with Pastor McKissick uh, out in Arlington, Texas. Thank you, Dr. Brogdon. And I appreciate the uh, background information and context that you've set for today's discussion and honor to uh, Dr. Cosby and others for having been invited to share in what I consider a very important uh, subject matter as we're seeing in real time this play out before our very eyes. I think you call it a, a reckoning is what's taking place. And also want to um, correct uh, something that uh, Dr. Christine Cosby uh, said about me having been a trustee at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, that is not true. I've not never been a trustee. That was a trustee at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, one of the six Southern Baptist uh, seminaries. And maybe that was some level of um, confusion about that because I recently, in light of the information you shared, challenged um, Dr. Bola and the Board of Trustees 
to go beyond just saying we apologize for what took place in the past as it relates to slavery, and particularly, specifically as it relates to slavery at Southern uh, Seminary, which they acknowledged slavery was the financial backbone of that institution in, in terms of the funding, uh, kept the school from going under twice, and the four founding uh, founders of Southern Seminary all owned slaves, 50 plus slaves, that document you referred to, Report on Slavery and Racism in the History of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, and I, I, once I discovered that, I, I, I didn't know that like many people didn't for years. My first experience on Southern's campus was in 1978, thereabouts. Um, I was a college student at Washington Baptist University, a small state, Southern Baptist Philadelphia College in Arkansas. In my senior year, they invited several black students, or well, black students from all over America, actually. And Southern was at a different place at that time to uh, come to a black church weekend. And oh my God, they had 25 black PhDs, THDs in religion or theology or related subject matters assembled all on the stage. Dr. Emmanuel McCall, who was, I think, a part time on faculty at Southern at the time, assembled that group. And 21 years old, out of Arkansas, with limited exposure, but <clears throat> I'm sitting in a room with guys that I didn't realize their greatness, like J. Uh, D. Otis uh, Roberts was a symbol there uh, <clears throat> that day. I'm thinking James Cone may have possibly be, been in the room that day, and I just didn't realize it. But every, uh, at least 25, Charles Kofa, who was in uh, Atlanta, uh, I forgot this tall, a uh, very impressive uh, gentleman, uh, quite a black scholar, his name escapes me at the moment. But I was just mesmerized seeing, I didn't even know 25 PhDs in 78 existed uh, among the black community and for them all to be assembled. What a historic gathering that they really don't highlight or talk a, a lot about today. So I formed a positive impression of Southern based on that one week in experience and it's recorded somewhere in that journals I used to have it years ago I got to try to find it that that they what took place that weekend and I, and I guessed all the names of the professors who were there very impressive weekend I decided to go to Southwestern Seminary though rather than uh Southern but that was my first impression but later on I'm going to cut this uh, short because I recognize we got a lot of people with a whole lot of good things to say here um uh, <clears throat> But upon discovering, and I think it was at the time this report that you referred to came out, the complicity with slavery and Southern Seminary, uh, like Dr. Cosby and others, that it, it requires some reckoning, uh, accountability. It's not enough. You bring fruit worth of repentance. Saying I'm sorry, but doing nothing, offering nothing in exchange is not biblical uh, repentance. And uh, upon challenging uh, them, uh, we finally got to the point of um, they were willing to offer a million dollar scholarship starting in 21 and adding a million for the next five years to total five million dollars. Uh, but as you said, it, it's being given to within the context of their students. And I'm, I'm also now being told they get uh, reimbursed for every scholarship they give to a black student. If that is true, there really is not costing them anything, is gaining them uh, some money. But my main goal was to get them to say, is it really biblical Christian to celebrate uh, John Broadus, a slave uh, holder, William Williams? Uh, is it really James Boyce Pettigrew? who said he was committed to slavery. He died unrepentant about slavery as well as brought us. Uh, I just think it's, it's not consistent with the faith uh, to celebrate uh, people who died in a state of feeling as if black people were less than. They moved the seminary from Greenville, what is that, North Carolina? Uh, uh, to Louisville looking for a white man's territory. That's why they came to Louisville, Texas, looking for white man's territory. And they want to get away from free blacks that they call 
Ichabus and Succubus, when you look up those names, they were very unflattering descriptions of black men. And so that's the DNA of the school. We kind of all know that. Uh, but my, my concern now is their unwillingness to, uh, A, not remove those names, and B, uh, a mindset on that campus. I got a student now who's really considering leaving Southern because even after offering those scholarships, there is a mindset about the black community at Southern, I'm being told, is just not healthy. And I've probably taken up my time and I will just leave it uh, at that. But I think this is a discussion very much worth having. Jimmy, how about you jump in? Yes. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, so uh, thank you once again, Dr. Brogdon, for uh, allowing me to be a part of this discussion. Um, the reason why I think uh, this conversation is very important is because um, I believe that unfortunately, there has been a, uh, a new form of the curse of ham um, ideology. Uh, and I don't know how familiar our listeners are to uh, the curse of ham uh, concept, but essentially it boils down to this idea that uh, Africans are cursed by God to be the servants of uh, white Christians. Um, and when I say that uh, a new form has been established, uh, I'm saying that now uh, they are suggesting that the gospel duty of African American Christians uh, is to serve and save white Christians. Um, and if you do not go along with that, uh, you're seen as a, a uh, unchristian, uh, unloving, um, not Jesus-like. Uh, and so this, this new gospel uh, is suggesting that it is our God-ordained duty to serve no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how many times they've shown us that they won't accept us, our job is to stick it out and to remain there and allow ourselves to be uh, uh, disrespected and devalued. Uh, I'm here to essentially say no. Uh, that's not our calling. Um, that's not what God has called us to do. Uh, and I'm here to say, uh, and this, you know, I don't know where my other panelists may stand on this position, but uh, I'm calling for all African-American Christians to exit all white churches and all white denominations. Uh, and this is drawing back to the tradition of our father, uh, our fathers, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, uh, when they strove to do everything that they could, uh, enduring all of the numerous self-degrading uh, situations to try to stick it out with uh, the white Christians um, in their local church, uh, eventually they got to a point where they said they couldn't, they, they realized that these, these people were not going to change. Uh, and they left and formed the first African-American denomination, which is the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, Richard Allen, uh, to be specific. Uh, and so this was a sort of uh, corporate uh, excommunication, a corporate excommunication uh, and I'm arguing that, that that excommunication should still be in play until we get real uh, repentance. Uh, and so any repentance that does not 
include things like reparations, uh, if that's not the starting point, um, I would say that, uh, that that's probably not a conversation we need to be in. And so until we get reparations and other forms of justice, uh, you know, we should remain outside of these white churches and white denominations. I agree with uh, James Cone uh, when he said that uh, the white church uh, is antichrist. Um, and so for me, I believe that the best thing, the most loving thing that we can do at this point in history, as we've seen uh, them show us who they really are, uh, numerous times, after, time after time, uh, they've proven that, you know, it'll only be token changes, uh, things that don't really make a difference, uh, that it's, it, it, it's, it's becoming of us, that we have to realize that we have to uh, separate ourselves uh, from these institutions. Okay. Joe? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my context is that I am an alum of Southern Seminary. I spent three years there from 1976 to 78 uh, in the Master of Divinity program. Uh, 42 years as a Baptist pastor, uh, born and raised in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, went to a Baptist college, went to Southern Seminary and came out and came to the uh, growing realization that what I had been taught at Southern Seminary, while profound and beautiful back in those days. Mm -hmm. It was also uh, a school that was laced and surrounded by white supremacy. Uh, everything about it spoke about white people and whiteness and, and the, uh, uh, the perpetuation of white systems. Uh, years later, I was called to the Highland Baptist Church, which is around the corner from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so I've spent uh, uh, the last 23 years uh, in a conversation with my alma mater about its relation to uh, the gospel and uh, in particular uh, race in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, in uh, 2018, I started uh, speaking publicly about Southern Seminary and its racist history. Uh, then in December of 2018, they came out with the report, Lewis, that you've got in your hand there. Uh, Following that, our group, uh, Dr. Cosby and I co-chair a group called Empower West Louisville. We made a call, we issued a call for repentance and repair uh, to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, in um, May of 2019. And basically we're told uh, no, uh, that there will be no reparation and that there was, in fact, that the, the whole uh, request to enter into that conversation was kind of summarily dismissed and scoffed at. And um, Dr. Moeller doesn't realize that, that uh, racism at Southern Seminary is an inconvenient truth that he has to face. And he has the opportunity, I think, to uh, change not only Baptists, but help change our country. He could lead the way. He could be a model for all of Christians in America for how to face uh, one's historic past, recognize it, uh, repent of it, and make a repair. You can't repent unless you repair. That's fantastic. Friends, what, what we're, we're having a, a theological conversation, and, and, a, and a part of entering into a theological uh, conversation is to understand the terms we're throwing around. So when we're talking about the, the white evangelical support of, of Donald Trump, and if you look at uh, even the exit polling coming out of the 2020 election, it is still upwards of 85% of white evangelicals continuing to support a president who, who was impeached, um, you know, who has such a, a checkered history. So this language of the death of the evangelical church, you have to go to the Genesis narrative and remember when God was conversating with Adam about when you partake of the fruit, if you do, you're going to die. Now, when they did, they just, they didn't drop dead. And so sometimes we think, well, churches are still around, but just because churches are still around doesn't mean that they're still alive. And so you can look at the data and, and over 10 million people in this country uh, are what you would call de-churched. They don't even go to church anymore. So the white evangelical church 
and white Christianity is in serious trouble in this country because of its refusal to really give an honest reckoning of what has happened in this country, the enslavement of Africans, the genocide of Native Americans, and all of these systems that uphold white privilege and just disenfranchise masses of black and brown people. This, this it, it just can't go on. So we have a question from one of our members of Empower West. And if you and, and all three of you, we got seven minutes for this question. So take about two minutes and 15 seconds each. What could our nation look like if evangelicals invest in an honest reckoning with our nation's racial sins and their role in perpetuating them? I mean, what, what, could, what are we missing? What could our nation look like if we actually did this? And we'll start and we'll work backwards. We'll start with Joe and work our okay. way back to Pastor McKissick. Okay. Wow. Well, <laughs> Uh, it's a beautiful question because it in, invites us to hope and invites us to see the world as God might see the world, where there's equality and harmony, where the black church and the white church are distinct and yet equal and working together. Uh, I can see uh, that kind of uh, recognition and repair awakening the white church in such a way that people would return to it. They would see it as valid and having a moral sense of authority. Uh, it, it could be a beautiful thing. Uh, and I think it would strengthen the white church as well as obviously the black church. Okay. Jimmy. Uh, there's a, a biblical principle that tells us that sometimes you have to die in order to live. Right. Um, and I think, uh, with with respect to you know the positions of my other panelists, I think that any attempt to try to repair uh, the white church, which at its foundation is white supremacy, um, you know, and even even the language of our nation's racial sins may uh, give the connotation that there's a, there, it was separate. It was okay, the white church. And then our and then our nation sins, right. but in reality, the white church uh, didn't merely perpetuate racial sins. Uh, they actually created the context for it. Uh, they carried it out, and then they created a theology to essentially uh, be a get out of jail for free card. Uh, so for me, honestly. I think the only way forward is for the best thing that we could do, according to uh, what some researchers uh, have stated about what is the like the most likely place that white nationalism or uh, white extremist groups would be associated with is white churches. White church. And so the the best way to eliminate white supremacy in America is for all white churches just to shut down. <laughs> I can't right. disagree with you, Doc. Uh, Am I, I think next? Not all of them, but yeah, yeah. But there you go, Pastor McKissick. I, I love the question, and I believe the church at her birth was the church at her Best. Yes. And I would think most of us would believe the church was birthed in the book of Acts. I can appreciate the perspective of uh, Reverend Jimmy Butts. I've only gotten to know him through social media communication, but I've really appreciated his passion, his scholarship, uh, his, his background, his testimony. Uh, and I, I do understand the position he's, he's taken, but I'm not ready to give up on what I consider the biblical model and the biblical I ideal. I, I, I still am ready to fight for uh, Dr. King's dream. Uh, the model I see with Reverend Joe Phelps and uh, Dr. Kevin Cosby is not, I mean, we talk about the death of the white church. We don't want Joe Phelps to die. That, there's always been that that remnant of white men and women, even going back to the civil rights movement, 
uh, who we could arguably say that some of King's successes could not have happened without Jewish community, some people in the white communities. There were white people who were victims of the hatred of uh, the Klan and other racist groups during the civil rights movement as well. So mm -hmm. the whole notion of just, you know, abolishing the white church period, it come and get different categories. All white churches aren't the same, just like all black churches aren't the same. I understand where that comes from, but I'm not quite on that, that page. Acts chapter 13, and I close with this. He said we only had two minutes. Uh, leadership <laughs> of the church there is sort of uh, identified by their geographic origin. And you have uh, two leaders there from um, Africa, I think Lucius of Cyrene and uh, Simeon, which is interesting, Dr. Thomas C. Oden, which is, if you, uh, I'll share about on this panel, has heard of him, read his books, no doubt. Uh, he argues uh, that Mark uh, himself may have been uh, African and Simon of Cyrene at the cross may have been the same Simon in Acts chapter 13. So, and, and then you had uh, Manian, who's believed to be from uh, Europe, a Roman, uh, Barnabas from Cyprus, which is Southern European, which doesn't necessarily make him white at that time. Uh, A.H. Sace called the people of uh, uh, of Cyprus Sudi in color at the time. But my point is you had Europeans, Asians, Africans, all gifted and leaders in the same church. And that was the first Gentile congregation. I think God was showing us what he really wanted there. And I think this question invite us back to dream of a situation like that. And so I, I, I still want to believe in that model and fight for that model, although I recognize all of the historical realities that Reverend Butts referred to, Reverend Phelps referred to, and that, that that's where the tension is, but I'm not ready to give up on the dream. I hear you. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm thinking about the Book of Revelation, and you know, some of the final churches Jesus addressed, two of them in particular, Sardis. This was a church that had a reputation of being alive, but Jesus' indictment was this: "You're dead." So when we're saying these white churches are dying. Of course, they're going to continue to have church, and we're not talking about they're going to physically die, but their their institutions, their witness, no longer reflects God's kingdom. And the last church is Laodicea. This church was completely blind, so blind that Jesus wasn't even in that church. He was outside knocking on the door, saying, "Will y'all let me in?" So right. this is the part of the biblical tradition that we're drawing on to to kind of say. White evangelical Christianity is really in trouble. And with that said, let's do one more question. Yeah. Uh, um, we... Yeah, go ahead, Joe, if you wanted to follow up on that. This is because logic that criticism, for example, of critical race. It's all a way to talk around the issue, the inconvenient truth that they have possession of uh, wealth that came from slavery that they still want to cling to and retain even while they try to half-heartedly apologize for the reality of slavery in American history. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, if, uh, if you're bringing your gift to the altar and your brother has something against you, Go make peace with your brother first and then come to the altar and bring your gift to God. I'm concerned about Southern Seminary and Al Mohler's relationship with God. If they are, if they are flaunting uh, the message of Jesus, Jesus who said, uh, uh, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is not going to enter the kingdom of the heaven? But those who do the will of my father, in other words, those who do the work of God, they're not doing the work of God. So part of my concern, I'm not just trying to attack Al Mohler. I'm trying to be concerned for Al Mohler and his soul. Yeah, uh, Dr. Brogdon, if, if I may, can, can I just make um, like a one minute uh, yeah. response really quick? Uh, so I, so yes, so Dr. King's dream, uh, you know, I support it. Uh, I think it's biblical. Um, but there are also other biblical principles that I don't think that we take in consideration when it comes to this issue. 
Uh, we also have to remember what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul makes two very important statements when he speaks of um, a, a individual who was, uh, you know, participating in incest. Um, he, and he was unrepentant in his, in his sin. Uh, Paul says to not associate with the immoral brother. And he also, he goes as far as I don't even eat with them. Um, and then at the end of the chapter, the, I believe it's the very last verse of the chapter. It says, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So I think that there is an imbalance in our theology when we suggest that the only Christian way forward is to always hold on to a particular relationship. This is the type of theology, and I'm not saying this particularly about you, uh, Pastor McKissick, because I'm sure you wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say, but I just want you to see how it's related, that if a person is in an abusive relationship, like we, I mean, it would be horrible theology to tell that person that, what they're supposed to do is this because of love, because, you, you know, uh, you want to you want to mirror a beloved community in your family. So you're supposed to sit there and allow yourself to be physically abused. That would be that, that, that's horrible theology, oppressive theology. And so what I'm saying exactly. is that, like, we have to take the full Bible's uh, understanding of how we deal with sinful people. OK, all right. Let's let's. Let's press a particular point, because um, not only has Southern issued this, um, a pretty detailed report, um, basically admitted, admitting to um, teaching heresy, okay? I mean, they, they basically admitted to teaching things that are completely heretical. But then when it was time to get to, so what are we going to do about it? It was really nothing. And if a theological institution that takes orthodoxy as seriously as they take it, and they have admitted to teaching something that's heretical, you would think that the recommendations would be very, very sober, very well thought out, but it was just basically a kind of dismissive approach. And then on yesterday, we get the report that um, um, the president of, of six uh, Southern Baptist seminaries issued a statement reaffirming uh, not, not the gospel of Jesus Christ, but reaffirming the Baptist faith and message, and then doubling down in its repudiation of critical race theory and intersectionality. That's antagonistic to the Baptist faith and message. And so my questions for my panelists, again, uh, take about two minutes and I'll give you two minutes and 17 seconds. <laughs> This sort of recent doubling down, uh, their support of Donald Trump, and then their refusal to have serious and critical conversations with non-Black Southern Baptist Black intellectuals, what does it say about their commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And we'll start with... Uh, We'll go to the middle and circle back around. So, Jimmy, we're going to start with you and go to Pastor McKissick and end with Joe. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I think, to be honest with you, like, I, I in some way commend them for being consistent, uh, okay. you know, uh, because, like, I actually agree with them. I agree that critical race theory which has as its uh, goal to, you know, undermine white supremacy is against the, the documents of the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> so, like, I, actually, I have no, I have no uh, you know, squabble about that. And, you know, just to be clear, uh, because someone can look at the, the plain text of these documents and say, like, okay, where is it at? I would say that, like, if you look at um, the founding documents of this country, yes, there, there is a surface reading of those texts, but then there is an implicit reading of those texts as well. So when it says all men are created equal, 
it was understood that you couldn't just you couldn't just read that the, the syntax and the uh, the vocabulary of those words and understand what they really meant. What they really meant was white all white men were created equal. And so in that same way, like, yes, you could, we could turn to these documents and people can act blind and say, well, where, where is it at? Well, I would say that uh, you have to look at the implicit messages in these documents. Okay. Pastor McKissick? Well, my position is that what they did yesterday and the whole fall out of hoopla over this CRT is a big to do about nothing. Uh, I honestly believe what's underlying this is Dr. Curtis Woods, which I'm sure you all are probably familiar with since he's a Louisville, Kentucky mm -hmm. uh, resident and was a professor until just recently at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I think he was recently called a pastor, very large, predominantly uh, Anglo Southern Baptist Church somewhere in the greater Louisville area. But he chaired the resolutions committee, resolution nine, I think in 2019, uh, that essentially says that uh, the Bible uh, is to be considered the primary authority in matters of race or theology. I don't know if any of us would disagree with that. And uh, the CRT uh, would have to uh, take a back seat. It would be uh, subject to whatever the Bible might say in that realm of, of race. I, I support that. Uh, notion, but he also very ably and adequately uh, articulated that just as Paul and uh, Jude referred to pagan philosophers uh, in their writings affirmatively, a broke clock can be right twice a day, where uh, CRT may be accurate in terms of identifying historic and current systemic injustice, then you, you you recognize that it could be an analytical tool. And that just got them all upset that he used that. Well, I said he it was an entire committee. It was an entire committee made up of blacks and whites, scholars, non-scholars, um, who uh, they were unified and convention overwhelmingly uh, voted to approve that. But there's a certain crowd in the SBC. And here's where I think uh, Dr. Butts argument, I just can't totally dismiss what he has to say because I recognize there is an element in the SBC that is, in my opinion, very racist. They would be very, they don't believe systemic injustice exists in the uh, penal system, legal system, education system, uh, economic system, uh, the, the uh, disparities in prison sentences, police brutality, they dismiss all of that. That's, that's so obvious today, and I got a, I, I share with Dr. Buzz, I got a huge problem with that. Uh, and they have no problem with DJT, Donald Trump, but got a huge problem with CRT. I'm, I'm really concerned about that. Um, but by the same token, I am committed to this notion of trying to bridge the gap. And I believe you all are too, because... Uh, Joe Phelps wouldn't be on this line and other alliances you all have if y'all didn't see the value of the races working together. I, I hear the illustration about, you know, where there's abuse, you, you remove from it. But uh, I've seen my mom and dad argue a lot. I've never seen my, my father physically uh, uh, attack my uh, mother, but I've seen a lot of uh, disharmony at certain periods in my home. But I'm so glad that my grandkids were able I could bring them to the same house with mom and dad. And they didn't allow whatever their marital problems were at some earlier point in their history caused them to divorce because I love bringing my grandchildren to not dad and his new girlfriend and mom and her new boo that somehow that it was it, the family, although maybe tattered at times, frustrated at, at times, stayed in tag. My wife described a very dysfunctional relationship in her early years. By the time I started dating her at 17, 18 years old, we married when she was 19, I was 20. I saw a man with no alcohol, superintendent of Sunday school, read his Bible uh, 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 several times a day. I mean, the man she described from her childhood versus the man 
she described the man I experienced until the day he died about four years ago were two radically different men. So I guess I'm still pleading for not giving up on this experiment called America or the unity of the church. And even when there are issues like what we saw with the presidents uh, yesterday, that's basically trying to uh, denounce CRT without denouncing Dr. Woods and the resolution committee. So as somewhat of a, I'm an outside insider, but somewhat of an insider, I respect the fact that they're leaving Dr. Woods' work in check because uh, there's a, a certain element in Southern Baptist Convention that when Blacks in leadership like Dr. Woods, the Jarvis Williams at Southern, Walter Strickland at Southeastern Seminary, even in 2012, Paige Patterson put out a letter saying he had a he was quaking about Fred Luna being elected because he could appoint Blacks with bad doctrine to all the committees. That is a fear of Black leadership in the SBC, which is racist to the core. But underlying all of this is targeting those black men whose names I just mentioned. So in one sense, what the presidents did yesterday would somewhat insulate the committee's work and keep it intact. And for that, and keep Dr. Curtis Woods' reputation intact. And for that, I'm grateful. Okay, we <laughs> wanna encourage you, if, you, if you're watching, uh, to, to, to put a question in, <clears throat> in the chat box for our panelists because the conversation is getting really good. Um, so we, we have, um, I, I think, a very, very interesting tension uh, among our panelists uh, between, a, a, you know, a, a more extreme uh, criticism uh, of the white church uh, versus, you know, wanting to be critical, but also wanting to, to, to maintain that connection. And, and I think that, that that's that tension is just a part of the nature of the of these conversations as you're trying to live into something bigger um, but but how do you be how do you be honest about how this church is functioning uh, and and its sort of alignment with with, with Donald Trump just adds a whole nother uh, problematic layer uh, to Absolutely. the equation for a group again trying to affirm Christian orthodoxy, what does the Baptist faith and message have to say about Donald Trump? That's something they just completely ignore. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, but then they want to, then they, I'm not even sure they really understand critical race theory. Cause I mean, there's just so many terms they're just throwing out um, as if even an academic discourse as vast and complex as critical race theory has nothing at all, not a singular insight <laughs> to sort of benefit, uh, you know, Christian theology. It's just, it's completely absurd to just well, try it, to dismiss I, that. I don't recall anything in what was written that suggested that they had a reason that they didn't explain why critical race theory was inconsistent with the gospel or in, inconsistent with their Baptist faith and message 2000 or or whatever it is. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm all for, I, I, I'm the only one that God can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. I, I don't give up on Al Mohler. And I use him because I, I use his name rather than talk about Southern Seminary. Because uh, uh, I've had a 23 year relationship with Al Mohler. And I do want to see him learn and grow as I want to continue to learn and grow. But uh, Al and some and in, in an institutional bind, on the one hand, they need black students. There's not enough white boys like me to. But at the same time, they also need that support. Trying to have it all by creating the scholarship to bring black students to teach their white supremacist theology. It's just insane. And I think we've got to continue to uh, implore them, uh, put pressure on them. We don't have legal pressure, but we've got the gospel. We've got the truth. We need to go to Al and the folks and say, come on, man, read your Bible. Let's come let us reason together about these things that matter. Can I, can I say something? Or do, we, do we have time for me to uh, say something real quick, Dr. Brogdon? Or we yes, need to get the do, questions. Right now, I haven't got word about the chat box, so go ahead. Okay, so... 
I think so. So one of the things I do want to respond to what uh, Pastor McKissick has said, uh, like you use the analogy, like building off my initial analogy about your parents and about how they have been like heated conversations, but your father never were, your, your father was never abusive, uh, like physically abusive to yes. your mother. I think, I think I understood that correctly. Uh, but so, yes, like, I, I think that's a, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but the problem with the analogy, however, is that there has been abuse in this relationship. White Christians as a whole and white evangelicals in particular and SBC in even more particular ways. Uh, there are things that they have done that have been physically uh, harmful to black people. And so like the analogy fails because there are things that we can point into our background where we can say, oh, they were abusive here. They were leading lynch mobs here. They were, uh, you know, whipping slaves here. Like, you know, so that's the problem with this. And, and, and one other thing, you know, we, I keep hearing about this, this remnant, this remnant that is just supposed to save uh, you know, white evangelicalism or the, or the SBC. Listen, when, when I look, I'm, I'm not saying that we give up on people, but one of the things you want to know what the remnant in Egypt did when What's God's that? judgment was coming, they left with the people of God. So if there is a remnant, then they need to leave, you know. So I think we're just married to this, 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 uh, you know, this almost this American Christian dream that, you know, the white church, like we cannot survive if the white church doesn't stay intact. And I think that's just a sad position to be in. And and even when these black people, when you're in the SBC, you're forced to be in a begging position because regardless of what we keep hearing about this remnant, you're always having to, like, I even saw, uh, like, some of the professors uh, at Southern Seminary recently, they had to get on video and essentially had to, you know, like, make all of the, the, the other white Southern Baptists feel better about their positions. You know, and that's, that's degrading. Like, why do, we, why do we allow ourselves to continue to be used in this way? That's not the gospel there. That's abuse. And so, yeah, we don't give up on people like Al Mohler or, or anyone else. But sometimes what Paul showed us, he said, give this brother over to Satan so he'll learn not to blaspheme. So part of him being saved and, not, and, and learning not to blaspheme was for the believers to disassociate with them. Right. This, this is the Bible. Well, I respect anybody who takes that position, uh, and I know I have helped to assist pay tuition to at least three students who left Southern or, or chose not to enroll in Southern and, and, and get ready to do another one because they have kind of reached your conclusion. It's an unhealthy place for Black people. So I guess I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too. I have sympathies and support for your position by the same token, I believe you can get it, Dr. Phelps and Kevin Cosby. Southern used to be a go-to place for black students, by the way. And even may, maybe for the more moderate and what they call progressive whites. I think you can still get a valid education, although the white supremacy, theological influences are there. But they're going to be everywhere if you go to uh, a white institution at, at some level. And um, I think you can learn proper not, expertise there. I would push. I would push back against that. You, you. Oh, there, let me hear it. There yeah, are white, white institutions yeah. that would own. That they would. They would own their complicity, their support. They. They would not try to to deny that. Um, and so, I mean, I, I work at a theological institution like that, uh, the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. Uh, this is a predominantly white institution that's moved into black space uh, and its primary disposition is to listen and to learn uh, and to admit those places of racist thinking, the ways in which they have benefited 
and and then they are partnering with African Americans uh, in trying to chart a new path. And so that that's the that's the kind of witness. That's what we're trying to call Southern into, and we're met with nothing but obstinance. So to then try to continue to say, well, 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 that's Christian when there's text in the Bible to say, you know, if you quench the spirit, if you don't hear what the spirit is saying to the church, okay, then then there then there's judgment, then then there's correction. And so that that's kind of the times in which we are in. These churches are turning millions of people away. They're not growing and they're being exposed for being really more more re- allegiant they they ally more closely to white supremacy than they do the gospel and when as christian brothers and sisters when we show it to them instead of repenting they deny it so they that's they double down they they double down now they've not only denied it they've doubled down on it yeah uh, to, to me it's it's profoundly egregious when uh you acknowledge as they did in december 2019 that we did these things yes they're here. Here's our history, but we're going to do nothing about it. That is, that's like a slap in the face. And I, I would never be an apologist for Al Mola, but he did call the curse of Ham a putrid exegesis. He totally rejects it, at least in, in theory. Now, in practice, uh, maybe another question. Uh, I challenge when he, he made it clear, and I disagree with his, he wasn't going to remove the name of those racist, those slaveholders, but, uh, and some might scoff at this, but I find value in it. He's going to build a memorial to the slaves that, whose monies that actually uh, kept that school alive and got it uh, going. And um, I thought Mola's uh, promotion of Donald Trump was just, just sickening and unchristlike to the nth degree. I agree with all on the panel. Who would feel that way? I, I, when I look at some of who Southern produced though back then and even currently, I think you can, including Dr. Phelps, Dr. Collins, you can get a valid Christian education. You just have to learn to throw out the uh, <laughs> bath water and keep the baby. <laughs> and I, I, I just don't know that I'm ready to say that it's uh, abandon it and hate it, uh, not to say no, I hate I, I'm not quite ready to get at that. I position. said nothing about hate though. Like I just true, want to true. correct that. I know, I know we, ha- we, we have to leave probably, but yeah, I said nothing about hate. I said nothing about throwing people away. That's, that's not in my uh, position. No, but I am about ready to say that Southern Seminary is a lost cause uh, after this double down uh, yesterday uh, of the seminary presidents, uh, I'm about ready to say it's a lost cause that not only doesn't need to be simply as an errant, but as someone on the other side of the, of the aisle, someone, an enemy almost. And I, I, I uh, have hesitated for decades doing that. I've tried to stay in relationship with Al Mohler personally and with Southern Seminary, but where they've gone at this point with their uh, criticism of uh, critical race theory and, and just their refusal to even come to the table yeah. to talk about repairing the damage that they've done. Uh, I, I seriously question their validity as a, as a, a Christian educational institution in this city. Well, well, friends, we have had a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, you know, thank our panelists, you know, for weighing in and I'm just going to pitch it back over to Crystal Uh, and she's going to give us some final directions uh, and we'll be done. Crystal? Dr. Lewis Brogdon, thank you so much. Uh, He's the moderator with the mostest. Thank you so much for all (laughs) that you do. And gentlemen, we appreciate you all engaging us in this conversation. If you're watching on our Facebook platform, we encourage you to please sign a petition. We've started a petition with change.org, a petition to encourage Southern Baptist Theological Seminary to first teach critical race theory, second, remove the names of its slaveholder founders from its buildings, and also urge the federal government to legislate and budget financially repair the legacy of centuries of white supremacy. 
And so we've got that uh, petition. We ask that you sign that petition and go ahead and share it. Uh, Dr. Brogdon, I think the best way to end this is allow each of the uh, panelists to issue their closing remarks and then we will get on out of here. So uh, gentlemen, if you wanna go ahead and uh, just give your closing remarks. Pastor McKissick, we'll start with you. Well, I, I wanna thank everybody for just welcoming me to this panel. And I'm so delighted to be introduced to persons like yourself, uh, Ms. Crystal and Dr. Brogdon, everybody on this panel, the many I was not previously exposed to. Uh, I, I feel like an honor and I want, if y'all ever in the Dallas area, well, for whatever big stake or whatever you want is worth, I will look forward to it. Uh, love for all of y'all to hear what you have to say in the context of my congregation of my leadership team. I'm excited about making these new acquaintances and relationships uh, here uh, today. And uh, 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 so that's about all I would have uh, to say other than um, this conversation leads me to believe the talk that's going on about creating, and this is what we haven't talked about today, a, a seminary that would, let's just be honest, maybe the elephant in the room sometime is there's a, a wide diversity of theology among African Americans. We're not all on the same page mm -hmm. on a whole lot of different subjects. And I'm not, I'm not on the same page with Southwestern Seminary in a whole lot of different uh, subjects. However, we don't have a school that would share the theology that many of us will share that at some points would be kindred to Southern based theology. It's hard to find that in an accredited black institution. That's the problem. And so those who share certain, what my, I call them orthodox views, but often called conservative views, when we create an institution like that, first class, I think whites will be attracted to that institution. I don't know one, one that exists, but that discussion is going on in some pretty key places now, because believe it or not, those who would consider themselves conservative or orthodox, they got all the problems y'all have with Southern, too, is just that the alternative institution does not exist. That's my closing remark. All right, Pastor McKissick, thank you so much. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Jimmy Butts, and I apologize, I uh, gave you uh, <laughs> Minister Joe Phelps' last name. You guys are related now, but- Yeah, uh, that's not, uh, he's not my father, just to <laughs> clear that up. Um, <laughs> last words. But, um, so my closing remarks, I would like to say, uh, I like to direct this, uh, these comments to uh, black Christians, uh, you know, I'm saying get out. Um, you know, don't let anyone continuously tell you that, uh, you know, you're being unloving. Uh, you know, you can't be a Christian if you hold this particular position. Uh, as we know, sometimes the most loving thing you could do is the hardest things you can do. In my own life, uh, I was going down the wrong path in my own life. And initially, you know, my father, he continued to hold my hand and continued to keep saving me from the consequences. But there was one time, the last time, when he just said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to help you this time. And I didn't like it at that time, but now when I look back, I can see that his decision to make me face the consequences was the very thing that caused me to change my life. And so, you know, I know this love, lovey-dovey type of, uh, you know, concept sounds really good that, you know, we never give up on people, but, you know, you're, you're not giving up on people. Uh, and, you know, just real quickly, you know, the comment that uh, Pastor McKissick made, you know, part of the reason, like, e even if I agree with, you know, the idea that, you know, there's no institution that represents our theology. Uh, well, one of the issues, a part of that is, is that a lot of our black uh, leaders and black uh, churches are continually giving their money to these white supremacist denominations and institutions. 
and giving their time, like, like, you know, wasting their time going to these conventions, trying to get on your hands and knees and beg these people to change when we could be using that energy to create our own and build our own institution and welcome everybody. So that's, that's a, my, my closing remark is to black Christians get out. All right, thank you so much, Reverend Jimmy Butts. And we'll end with you, Minister Joe Phelps. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to be with these gentlemen and to talk about this very important subject. I realize I've been talking a lot about Al Mohler and sort of pointing the finger at him. And I need to uh, close by saying that I'm, I'm inviting Al Mohler Southern Seminary, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, to lead the way, not only for Southern Baptists, but for our nation to show us how repentance and repair can go hand in hand and create a more just and more uh, equal society. It's not just Southern Seminary that needs to do this work, however. I'm very proud of uh, the church I served for 21 years, Highland Baptist Church here in Louisville. Their anti-racism team is doing tremendous work trying to evaluate how they, as an institution, are called upon to make repair. That needs to go across the board with all of our white churches, all of our white institutions, our cities, our states, all the way up to federal government. Until that day when we found equality and we discover, we look up one day and realize that the, the, the dream that God had, that on earth as in heaven has become reality, that's, the, that's what we aspire for as Empower West, as the people of God. And I'm grateful to be part of this conversation. Minister Joe Phelps, thank you so much for ending us on that note. Dr. Brogdon, did you have anything to say before you go? Uh, first off, again, congratulations on a successful radical MLK course. Anything to say about that uh, before we get out of here? Yeah, just a heads up. Uh, I'm going to be teaching two exciting courses this spring that uh, will be college and seminary courses that we are opening up uh, to auditors. One will be on Monday night through BSK. It's a black and womanist theology course. And we've got some outstanding uh, black and womanist theologians who are gonna be guest lecturers. So that's Monday night at six. You just go to BSK uh, to, uh, to get uh, enrolled for that class. And beginning the first Thursday in February, Simmons College of Kentucky will follow up the Radical King course with the course uh, on the impact of slavery. And so we're gonna spend, it's just gonna be six weeks uh, it'll be on every Thursday. Uh, and I, I mean, I've got a, another stellar lineup uh, of guest lecturers. So please, uh, the information will be going out probably in another week. We're just lining out our last speaker and you're gonna be excited about this last speaker. Uh, and so uh, look forward to that class in February. So we'll continue doing this kind of educational advocacy to give you the skills and the tools you need to take up this hard work uh, in the world. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Brockton. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this installment of the virtual West Louisville Forum Solutions for Urban America. Again, thanks so much to our sponsor, Park Community Credit Union. Thank you so much. And until next time, bye. <laughs>